My name is uh, Dennis Djokovic, and I'm very happy to moderate today's session. Uh, I'm the medical director for the Organ Donation Organization, and uh, I'd like to, uh, to start off today's session. So first, uh, the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I'd also like to thank Paladin for their support of the uh, ATI seminar series. And to start off uh, our, our presentation today, I'd like to give a little bit of a, his or a background on our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Matthew Weiss is a pediatric intensist who works in Quebec City at the uh, University of Quebec. And he's an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at University of Laval. Uh, very talented, very busy and accomplished uh, individual multiple provincial and national donation roles, most notably as the medical director of donation at Transplant Quebec. Uh, his research interests mainly focus on the Im implementation, my apologies, of legislative and policy reform in organ donation. Uh, he's the scientific lead for the International Donation and Transplantation Policy and Legislative Forum. He's the national lead of the Leader Research Program, which evaluates the implementation of reforms in Nova Scotia, which I think we're all gonna be very excited to learn more about as we go along. Um, on a personal note, Matthew is a wonderful individual to spend some time with. And it's been a couple of years since we've been able to share a dinner together, Matthew, and I, I look forward to the opportunity very soon that we can do so again. So with, uh, without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to open this uh, meeting and have Dr. Weiss begin his presentation. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, I miss those uh, in-person meetings as well, Dennis. Uh, and thanks for that uh, the kind introduction um, and the invitation to be able to speak today. So. Um, most of the uh, the information we're going to hear today is coming from this forum, which we're going to hear all about. And let's see if I can figure out how to advance. There we go. Um, and uh, but this is what we're really going to be focusing on: the legal and ethical foundations um, of an effective system, and and what are some of the bedrock principles that under um, undergird all of the stuff that we do in an OTDT system. Um, before I, I go on. Um, I obviously Dr. Gottesman was a pediatric intensivist, but I think many of you uh, know him. He was uh, is really a pillar of the uh, both adult and pediatric ICU com uh, community who uh, tragically uh, passed away earlier this month. Um, so this is all in honor of him, the teacher, the physician, and the friend. And you know this being one of his classic phrases on round uh, rounds. Even when I was a fellow, I think um, he was much more convinced that I knew what he was looking for than I was. But um, he was. Um, really um, someone that I emulated a lot and um, he's very much missed. So just wanted to make sure I mention him. Um, as we go on, you know, there, I know there are a lot of people who are less familiar with uh, OTDT system. So I'm gonna give just a little bit of background here. Um, any, any donation and transplantation event is a series of intersections. And one of the first strands are the, is the recipient. Um, and this could be someone waiting for any one of a number of organs, most frequently kidneys, but uh, heart, lung, liver, et cetera. Um, and they're gonna be matched with a patient who is a potential donor. Now that patient is a potential donor. Um, their family is almost universally um, experiencing one of the major tragedies of their lives. Um, and they are going to be making a decision around donation under the um, umbrella of that stress and the the loss of a loved one. And that intersects with the activities of an ODO here, obviously Transplant Quebec, but the Alberta North or South um, organ donation organizations um, certainly play those roles in Alberta. Um, that is going to try to link the uh, those organs from the potential donor to uh, a potential recipient who is an appropriate match. All the while, they're going to be communicating with the transplant teams um, to confirm organ eligibility. Are there those recipients who are um, medical matches um, with the um, potential donor? What testing needs to be done on the patient who is a potential donor to confirm that their organs are suitable for transplant? The hospitals are going to be interacting because this all is a, a major logistical challenge. There need to be a, a, an operating room for the for the donor, and there need to be several operating rooms, obviously, in the hospitals where the receivers are, um, where the recipients are located, and there need to be the uh, resources often in the ICU or on the wards to care for the recipients post-operative. So it's really, um, and all of this 
is is going to be framed by the legal and policy framework in which the the system operates and so it's really something of uh, almost a miracle that these things come together to create a donation and transplantation um it does though um here in quebec it's four to five hundred a year i'm sorry i didn't get those numbers for alberta but as much as that is a success story the um, the reality is is that we could do better and the, um, what we did with the forum was bring together international experts to create consensus guidance for all stakeholders, people like myself or Dennis who work clinically and administratively in the system, but also people more like, and I saw her on the line, Jen Wolfsmith, um, who is the mother of a, a, of a patient who became a donor and who has an idea of what it's like to be on that end. Obviously, patients were on the wait list to bring all those people together um, and to who aspire to link evidence and ethical concepts to legislative and policy reform in an OTDT system. So this, these slides, don't worry, I know the, the font is small. The point is not to read the details. The point is to see the variability. So the blue slide there on the left, um, that shows the number of donors indexed per million population across the world. Each one of those horizontal lines represents a different country. The numbers on the right in the yellow are numbers of transplants in, in those countries. And the thing I think that jumps out is that there is a, just a, a tremendous amount of variability. Now, some people might be quick to say, well, of course there is. These, these are representing different systems, different healthcare um, environments that are funded either publicly or privately. And that's true. There is a lot of uh, variability there. But if it, the within this data, you can see that even countries, for example, in Western Europe that have well-financed healthcare systems and decades of transplant experience, there might be three or four differences in their performance related to number of donors and or transplantation. And no country has yet achieved what is one of the goals of all um, international recommendations is the idea to become self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is defined as being able to respond to all the transplantation needs within a jurisdiction, either through recovery from living or deceased donors within the, the, uh, the borders of that jurisdiction or through ethical exchanges with other countries. And to date, even in the highest performing countries, Spain, the US, um, they, no country has been able to eliminate a wait list and re respond to all of their needs. Um, what that means in Alberta, as of the end of last year, there were 312 Albertans who were waiting for a transplantation, obviously the majority of those being kidney, but all organs represented. So with that kind of variability, and uh, there, obviously people have sought solutions. This is just a, an example article from the lay press. Um, and the reason I picked it out is because of the subtitle, which is that the, the organ donor system is costing lives, but could be easily fixed. Um, and that is a theme. When you look at the uh, at lay press articles around how to reform a donation system, they're gonna throw a lot of single um, issue solutions at you. And, and sometimes they're gonna be presumed consent, the idea that all people should be assumed to be a donor unless they have registered otherwise. Mandated choice where say, if you are signing up for your driver's license, you are obligated to make a choice around donation donor registries um, and expanding the uh, publicity around them and making ease of access. And uh, those have all been, um, been proposed as the simple, easy solution that will solve problems. Fortunately, when you look at the data, none of those are as easy a fix as you would think. So this is a 2019 review um, based on the Global Observatory of Donation and Transplantation data. Um, and they found no significant difference um, in either donation or transplantation rates between opt-out or opt-in countries, otherwise known as uh, presumed consent or explicit consent countries. That's not to say that it doesn't make a difference. And certainly what we've seen in the UK is that since they have implemented um, deemed consent, as they call it, which is presumed consent, um, the same, same uh, terminology, um, they have seen significant increases in the regions of the UK that have implemented that, but that implementation came with a lot of other factors and teasing out that difference is tough, but overall, globally, no significant difference. Um, similarly, this article from 2015 in JAMA looked at um, variability within states in the US to see what policies um, would be most associated with a uh, higher donation and transplantation rate. And unfortunately, nothing really stood out. Um, the, the major effect that they were able to observe was that the more money that a, that a jurisdiction put in, that a state put into their system, the better it performed. But things like 
specifically focusing on donor registries, specifically looking at mandated choice, um, those type of issues, none of them were the magic bullet that they hoped the, the, the people who implemented those policies hoped they would be. So when we turn internationally and we see what guidance existed, because this is certainly something that we did as we were organizing the forum, you know, there are several landmark documents, and I think most of you would be aware, uh, familiar with these, including this, the, the Declaration of Istanbul, which is um, clearly a, a bedrock ethical paper around how to manage um, a donation system. But a lot of it is focused on living donation and making sure that living donors are free of coercive tactics that might lead to them um, organ recovery against their will. Um, the Madrid Resolution also um, was a major paper published in 2011 based on a, on a conference that happened in Madrid in 2010. Um, and that was this is one of the first papers that really promoted that idea of striving for self-sufficiency and offered a lot of practical advice on how to organize um, an ODO. Now, despite those documents, there are still challenges. Um, there is often confusion on the legal and policy framework and sometimes conflict between the legal, what is written in the law, in the policy um, on how those are, in, are enacted. Um, certainly that's the case here in Quebec. We were just, um, the, uh, this being National Organ Donation Week, there's been a lot of discussion around say, what is the role of the family and the potential conflict between the fact that the law in Quebec is relatively clear that the, um, when you have registered your intent to donate in a registry, that is a binding consent um, and should be respected. But at the same time in the law, there's an inclusion that for if there is a compelling reason not to donate, um, donation should not be pursued. Clearly, if the patient had a, uh, a cancer or some other transmissible disease to a recipient, that's clear. But it is less clear what to do when the family states that the person had changed their mind. And it does that qualify as a compelling reason? Certainly today at Transplant Quebec, our policy is to respect the family in those situations, even though that, that in some ways conflicts with the, um, uh, certain interpretations of the law. So it's just an example, and that can lead to confusion. Um, that's an example that I gave. Other examples are the, the distinction between, say, mandatory consideration of referral versus mandatory referral. Um, we're gonna talk about that more uh, towards the end of the talk. I know that's an issue here in, uh, in Alberta. Um, there are privacy concerns um, in, in certain jurisdictions, including Quebec. The ODO is not considered as part of the healthcare team with access to confidential patient information. So in this, in a, um, when you are in that circle of confidentiality, so for, for example, if I were to consult nephrology, I don't need to get consent to share confidential patient information with a colleague within the hospital, yet when Transplant Quebec is considered outside of that circle. And so there are sometimes concerns around sharing information with the ODO. Um, there's inadequate enforcement of existing legislation. So um, if there is mandatory referral in certain jurisdictions, if no one is doing an audit to assure that every one of the potential donors has been referred to the ODO, and if that audit is not being fed back to the clinicians in the hospitals, then the it's, it's the example I often give. It's kind of like saying there's a speed limit, but never having a cop on the street. Sure, it's there, but are people really going to respect it if it's not enforced? Um, and then, like I mentioned, a lot of people have the idea that one single issue, um, uh, either policy or legislative change is gonna solve all your problems. And so they look for the silver bullet. So that's the, the, the context of why we wanted to come together to create the forum. Um, I'm just gonna give a couple slides on the methods um, of what we did. This is the timeline. I mean, it actually started a little bit before this in the uh, fall of 2021, where we organized our committees to bring together international experts. There was a lot of backing, not only from the Canadian society, such as the Canadian Transplantation Society, CBS, um, but there were also leaders from the International Society of Organ Donation Procurement and the Transplantation Society um, to, we, and so we brought everyone together and we completed the, the chapters um, and defined what the chapters would be. In March, we had a, um, a healthcare consulting firm, STA Communications, who um, trained up the, um, the chapter leads on how to create consensus around the, the various topics. The chapter pre uh, leads presented their, um, 
their final topic list in May in a series of webinars with all the other chapters to make sure there wasn't overlap or missed opportunities on topics. From June to September, there were literature reviews, there was writing, there was deliberation. Um, and then in October, um, each group submitted their recommendations and were presented at our at the hybrid um, meeting, which happened in um, in Montreal. Um, although most of the participants were virtual, um, and then we are in the process of finalizing the uh, the submission. Uh, most of them have been submitted, and we're awaiting publication. So we had a lot of participants. Um, they came from all continents. And I believe it was something like uh, 15 countries. I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but you can see a lot of diverse um, expertise, um, geographical diversity, um, linguistic diversity. So we, although we didn't necessarily have global rec rec uh, representation, we certainly had international representation. And it really led to some rich exchanges on trying to, to get down to the core of what are the fundamental issues that um, every system could aspire to in a donation and transplant environment, regardless of your resources? Um, there were patient, family, donor, and family partners that were part of every one of the committees, um, from the scientific committee, the planning committee, and each of the chapter committees. Um, and we actively sought their input. Um, we wanted to make sure that their lived experience was kept at the core of what we were doing. Um, and we manage potential conflicts of interest. Everyone was required to uh, submit a conflict of interest form. No uh, relationships with, um, with any for-profit entities were discovered. And um, all the funding for this, the majority came from the government of Quebec with in-partner or cash funding from governmental agencies um, such as uh, Health Canada and Canadian Blood Services. So, um, if you look, I'm gonna present here some select recommendations. Obviously, we're not gonna go through them all, but I really wanted to focus on some of the ethical and legal issues. Um, the first chapter, the first domain was the baseline ethical principles. This was led by Dale Gardner, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, works in the UK as essentially Sam Shimmy's role in, in the UK. Um, and what they did was instead of creating necessarily new principles, they built on existing documents because they quickly identified, well, look, the Declaration of Istanbul is there, the WHO guiding principles are there. Let's build on this to create a framework to evaluate new proposals. Um, and at the core, um, this is something that wasn't published in our in our work, but uh, it's the same author, same authors, Dale and Andrew, were the 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 leads of the the ethical group. Um, this is one of the, the, the guiding lights. Is that really when you boil down most almost all of the the issues around donation and transplantation, there are two fundamental um, rules that are the most important. And that's the dead donor rule and the consenting donor rule. The dead donor rule being, as we've all heard, it's that the, the patient must be determined dead before um, organ donation proceedings of a vital organ commences, and that recovery cannot cause the death. Um, it's been, there are certainly some nuances in how it is formulated, but those are the fundamental concepts. And the consenting donor rule, being that there must be valid informed consent either before the patient's death or um, and, and or confirmed at the time of the when the patient becomes an actual uh, potential donor. Um, and if you when when we say that those two issues inform everything, well, so for example, um, I know sometimes there is um, debate around when you can approach a patient um, in terms of um, discussing the possibility of donation. And that really stems from the dead donor rule and the strictest reading of the dead donor rule. Um, those, the approach would be considered part of transplantation proceedings and therefore should not be done until um, death has been determined. Now we all know that that's not possible in a donation after circulatory death scenario. And so this is, that's an example where there are aspects of the dead donor rule that need to be respected, but we can pull back a little bit and, and understand the, uh, the ethical limits of these concepts. So um, once again, the, um, the same existing guidance documents, there they are again, and the, they were included, all of those, there were 30, I believe, um, ethical principles that were included as an appendix in, um, in that chapter. Um, and you can see some of those principles, um, you know, this one, not, not very complicated, um, that, and I think everyone would, would agree that, uh, that physicians determining a potential donor has died should not be part of the transplant procedure. So if you are the, the transplant surgeon, you should not be doing the apnea test on the patient, non-controversial. But where you can see there, there might be some controversy around 
in a DCD setting after the patient has been determined dead. And if there was one of the anesthetists who uh, was part of that death determination, well, is it or is it not ethical for them to say reintubate the patient um, for lung inflation, understanding that then they leave and they have no other role? Is that reintubation part of donor management or is it part of transplantation proceedings? There are reasonable interpretations on both sides of that issue. Um, another example might be that organ donation should be a financially neutral act that comes from the Declaration of Istanbul. Clearly, we don't want people to profit off organ donation. Um, we don't want people to be making money selling their organs. That certainly could introduce an element of coercion um, for people who have uh, fewer resources available to them. Um, but at the same time, we don't want donation to be a, an expensive act. And so how much, um, say, family support for people who, um, whose loved one had to be transferred to another center? Um, is, it, is it ethically acceptable to pay for the hotel or um, a travel cost for that family? That's an example where, once again, reasonable people could, could disagree on whether or not that represents some kind of subtle coercion or is just support to make sure that it is a financially neutral act. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Dale's group said, no, these are nice principles in these documents. But how do we determine if a proposed policy is in alignment with those foundational principles? And I really, really like what they did. First of all, they said they set up some, some guideposts for what we need to do. And, and first of all, there's a duty to consult. And what we mean by consulting is, is talk to all the stakeholders, not to keep it an internal discussion between the leadership of an ODO, but to open it up to everyone who's going to be touched by whatever policy is being proposed. Um, there should be lay and patient representation on decision-making bodies. And the more detailed or granular that decision is, the more we're gonna need lay people involved because they really need to be um, implicated to understand how this might affect the patient experience. And that last point is that the, everything should be done in a transparent manner with any conflicts of interest mitigated as much as possible. And what they proposed was this model um, when you're actually making an evaluation that includes, and it's important to note that, that this is proposed that each one of these steps is necessary before approval of a new policy. So one, does this increase the possibility of self-sufficiency? Is there a reasonable chance that this would, would decrease the amount of time that people wait on wait lists and, de and increase the availability of organs? Margin of appreciation, I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Their efficacy, so is it, is it even effective? So when we talk about heparin um, in the context of DCD, <coughs> is a reason to believe that this is going to even work, whether or not it might, um, um, whether or not uh, it's going to increase the function of the organs after transplantation. Protection is a big issue. Are there specific groups that need to, that, and, and protection issues, either for historically underrepresented minorities um, or for the, um, other groups that might potentially be at risk from a policy, and then policy approval. So as I mentioned, margin appreciation is, a, is a, um, an idea that I think merits the most attention. It was one of the things that I really um, appreciated um, from, from their work. And it's a, it's a concept that was borrowed from European jurisprudence where there are a lot of different countries with different laws around issues. And the question is how much variability is acceptance? And what this does is it creates a, a sense of a gray zone between um, the universally accepted and the universally unaccepted. And so um, clearly in, the, in that green zone is the need for consent and, and for, for donation with the red zone being execution to remove organs um, and, and that being ethically unacceptable. But the question in the margin of appreciation is that reasonable people who are educated around donation can reasonably disagree, say, around the ethical acceptability of presumed consent, with a lot of people arguing that is a completely reasonable um, method to construct a consent model, and other reasonable people saying it poses a risk to autonomy. Um, and I think that those and where the decision around a policy, it must fall at least within that margin of appreciation. And then an individual jurisdiction needs to consult their, their stakeholders, including the general public, to make an understanding of what would be appropriate for the people in that jurisdiction. Um, efficacy in that spiral was also something that I very much appreciated. It really does imply a moral obligation to evaluate practices in donation. I think sometimes donation research is seen as a bit of an add-on or it's something like, okay, we got this policy, but um, yeah, we hope it works. Um, but there's really, it, it really emphasizes that doing research in this space 
um, is, is, a, is really a moral question to make sure that we are not implementing something that could cause unintended consequences or even decrease the availability of organs. Um, obviously that research requires um, oversight with people with specific expertise about some of the nuances of donation research. The legal foundation groups, well, first of all, they recommended a unified law. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the status in, in Alberta, but I know in Quebec, the, the statutes that touch donation are kind of dispersed throughout the civil code. Um, and they, we do not have a uniform uh, transplant Quebec law. Um, but that law also, that second point is key as well. It needs to be integrated into the legal system. So for example, in the Charter of Canadian Rights, um, discrimination by something such as age is explicitly forbidden. Um, that being said, we discriminate all the time on the, on the, the, the principle of age and say if there is a 75 year old who is waiting for a heart as opposed to a 40 year old who's waiting for a heart, um, though that the discrimination happens routinely. Um, and we need to make sure that we can justify that and we need to be conscious I, I, I really appreciated that concept from the, the legal foundations group that we need to remember that donation and transplant law does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs in the context of existing laws, especially around the Charter of Rights. Um, the the uh, Legal Foundations Group also strongly came out in support of mandatory referral, mandatory referral being the concept that every patient who is a potential donor is required to be referred to the organ donation organization. Um, and they also specifically added that if necessary, privacy laws should be amended to ensure that that information can be communicated to the ODOs for the purpose of meeting mandatory referral obligations and implied in that and explicit in the text is that the ODO should also have access to the charts of patients who died but were not referred um, to make sure that any um, uh, quality improvement initiatives can be performed to ensure that that the uh, that future um, donors will not be missed and that future mandatory referral obligations will be met. Now, just a, a word on mandatory referral and what it is or isn't. I know there's been a, um, a fair amount of debate um, in the, the donation community and even the, the, the general community lately around this. So one thing that mandatory referral is, is that it's a removal of eligibility decision from the bedside. Um, frankly, ICU docs are always going to be inadequate at determining who or who is not a, a good donor. Um, and that is, the, the reason that is fundamentally is because the wait list changes. Um, I know we have some transplanters on the line and they know very well that depending on who is on their wait list, they might say yes to a patient and the exact same patient two weeks later when their wait list has changed, they would have said no um, because they don't have anyone who is say sick enough to justify the acceptance of a marginal donor. And trying to learn as a bedside clinician and the ICU trying to predict is, a, is, is just, it's always going to be a losing ball game because we don't know what the wait list look like, looks like. Um, it also, I see, this is a survey, I think I've shown this at an ETI rounds before. Um, this is a survey that myself and Miguel Chasse and tons of other collaborators worked on with the trials group. Um, these are, this is from a survey where we asked ICU docs throughout Canada, um, 260 roughly, responded around why in the past they had not referred. And you can see the number one reason is organ dysfunction. But the problem with that, like I just mentioned, is that you just don't know. Um, other reasons were, were also surprising and, and, and frankly, in some ways struck me as, as potentially paternalistic. So that the, the idea that the family is too upset, the family may or may not, the family is likely going to be upset. They've just lost a loved one. But whether or not donation is going to worsen their upset or to, um, to actually provide a potential relief for that family is not really for us to decide. It is for the family to decide once donation is proposed. Um, there are several, you know, of almost 40% of respondents said they hadn't approached because they assumed that the patient's family religion would preclude donation, which once again, relatively paternalistic. We, I know that both in Quebec and I assume in Alberta as well, have had donors from all kinds of religious and um, uh, social backgrounds. Um, and then the, the family desires to leave the unit once again, probably, but maybe if donation was an opportunity, they would want to stay. It's also important to know that mandatory referral, there is a difference between law, policy, and practice. Um, this is from the same survey, although a different manuscript. Um, I really like this, uh, this slide, even though it's a little um, confusing at first. So you can see in those, the, the bars that are red, those are provinces without mandatory referral. And you can see that when there is not mandatory referral, Nobody in the survey said that there was. The inverse is not true. 
those with the, the provinces with the blue lines, those are provinces where mandatory referral is in place, but the gray bars are the number of people who said that it is not in place. And so you can see that with the exception of Ontario, no province with at least some aspects of mandatory referral, obviously mandatory consideration in Alberta, but no province the, the, the had the majority of respondents say, yes, there is. Um, and several um, had, had said, no, you can see in Manitoba, it was 75% said they do not when actually they do, it's on the books. Um, so that just shows that just because the law is on the books, that doesn't mean that it's going to impact practice. It needs to be um, a, a knowledge translation work to make sure that that practice impacts, uh, or that law impacts practice. It's also important to know that referral does not equal approach, and I should have included here that that does not equal a consent model as well. What we're talking about is that they're referred. Now, it might be they're referred, and as I often joke about with, uh, with my group here, is that, yeah, you refer that 90-year-old with a, with a chronic leukemia who is hospitalized for his rabies, well, look, we're not going to approach that family. You're going to know that's not a donor, but that family should still, that patient should still be referred. Um, and then consent is a separate issue. Early is important because if you refer the patient an hour before you extubate for DCD, you're not going to be able to organize donation in that time. There needs to be a reasonable amount of time and the family needs to understand that donation referral is happening so, they, so that donation can reasonably be organized. And I just have a note here that MAID is tricky um, in terms of whether or not they should fall under mandatory referral. I think that is something that the ODOs and the hospital should, um, should discuss. So in terms of um, choice of consent model, I just have a couple notes here. We did um, have a chapter devoted to, often it's, it's framed as a, an opt-out versus an opt-in consent model. Um, and the, the prevailing um, recommendation was that it should be in line with the values and cultures of the community. Um, and, but whatever model you have, the OTDT infrastructure needs to be supportive of it. And, um, the, and it must build and maintain public trust. The, the, the population needs to understand that whatever consent model there is, the patient who arrives at the hospital is going to be treated as a patient first, who are going to try to save life. And then there will, there will, if there is an inability to save life, there will inevitably be, inevitably be a transition towards potential donation discussions. So where to now? As my friend Dave Hartel said, I got to trademark the, the green arrows that uh, populate the slide deck. Um, we are in the process of finalizing the reports. We are producing summaries, engaging stakeholders. I'm doing things like talking to the, um, the legislative um, body here in Quebec to try to get a public consultation. Um, we're having talks like this. Um, and we are disseminating both to professional and to lay groups. And um, we are trying to engage with international organizations, obviously, such as the ISODP or um, the European Society of Transplantation. Um, the, the recordings and the, uh, are, are available on this website. Feel free to go and look at that. The, um, the actual documentation is just about ready to be shared widely. Um, we're just waiting, like I said, for the last little bit for, prior to publication. So that's the talk. I, I lost track of time. Um, oh, wow. We've got plenty of time for, uh, for discussion. So that's great. I thought I was uh, running a little long. Always interesting to hear about the, the many different uh, approaches there are to the world of donation and transplant. And you know, I'll open up to questions uh, in a minute here. But you know, one of the things that uh, that has always struck me about organ donation and transplantation, and it may help just with uh, you know the very people that are on this uh, on this session, is that you know, transplantation donation is such a special place. Uh, it's a special program for a number of things, but one of the reasons is it's built differently. You know, if you have a hospital and you want to build a trauma program, you, you find trauma surgeons and trauma nurses, you make a trauma team and you make a trauma program, and then you open your doors and you wait for trauma patients. And donation isn't like that. Donation starts and only starts with trust and with a gift. And I think that's where the challenge uh, that, you know, Dr. Weiss has presented uh, illustrates that it, it always starts with what is the best way and, and, and is there an only way or is there varied ways of approaching how do you create trust and how do you receive that gift. Uh, so thank you very much, Matt, for going through things. Um, for those interested in asking questions, please feel free to put uh, your little hand uh, up. Uh, the, the icon and I will go through and if I'm missing you then uh, feel free to to just uh, throw out your question 
and we'll go from there. But Matt, maybe I can start out uh, with my own question. Um, if Canada develops uh, its organ donation and transplantation programs as you would want, where do you see us in five years? Well, I think one um, thing that is is ongoing is data sharing and um, quality improvement initiatives that are pan-Canadian. So I would love to be able to today give you the results of uh, the, the output of a um, provincial donor audit that I've done here in Quebec. Unfortunately, I can't do that because our, you know, we don't have, we have it, but it's, it's slow to develop. It's, we we're not a um, nimble enough to be able to update it regularly. So first of all, I'd like to have that capacity, but then I would love for my results to be directly comparable, let's say the results in Alberta and to be able to see what we could learn from each other. So, you know, if I, how I, if I were to say, oh, wow, you guys have uh, um, approach rates that are 10 points higher than ours. What are you guys doing? How is that happening? Um, and I would love to be able to, to have those kind of exchanges based on, uh, on real time data. Um, and I think that's, that's one, a major issue. Um, so I, I guess that's one the sharing of, of high quality data that has uh, universal definitions was, is, was a key aspect. Thank you, Matt. Um, let's see if we can go through some questions here. Uh, Flavia, I think you have a, a question. Feel free to uh, start up. Sure, happy to. I thought I put it in chat. Nice to see you, Matt. It's been a little while. Um, it is. And um, thank you. Great presentation, and especially that clarification around the mandatory referral. As we continue to push um, the voices up from the patients that we serve, and as we're looking to improve things here in Alberta, there's always discussions that um, organ donation, transplantation need to be kept separately. Um, we know that that is not what is happening in other jurisdictions. And I'm just wondering if you could help shed more um, information, light on that as we continue with efforts to uh, be able to do that here in Alberta. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that there, there are some bright lines that need to be um, very, very much respected. So, you know, I, I work very closely with Prasanta Chaudhary. He is the director of transplantation at Transplant Quebec. And, you know, I would certainly never have Prasanto either participate in or give advice on a, um, a neurologic determination of death, a brain death exam. You know, that's, that would be inappropriate. That would be as appropriate as me going in and telling them how to suture up the, the, the kidneys once they are uh, implanted. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but it doesn't make any sense from, a, from an ethical standpoint. Now, that being said, there needs to be mechanisms of quick and easy exchange of information. Um, so, you know, to, to determine if a patient who is a potential DCD donor is going to be eligible or not, well, we got to have a quick, we got to be able to rapidly give the relevant information to the transplant teams. And that is going to determine, A, how are we going to approach this family? And B, if we even approach this family at all, because often what happens is if we've been able to communicate some of the basic information around the, the, the patient's case, the transplanters might say, you know what, uh, whether or not they want to donate, it's not going to be possible. Then you talk to that family and they say, and they ask if donation is possible. Well, you can immediately say, we've considered it. We've talked to the transplant teams. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not going to be a reality here. Um, maybe tissue donation will, but organ donation is not going to be possible. And that really facilitates rather than giving them false hope to say, oh boy, maybe we'll go check, you know, and then they're waiting for those calls and maybe get their hopes up that donation is possible only to be able, only to have to take that away. So I think those relationships need to be um, tight, but I, uh, but certainly there needs to be respect around the no transplanter being involved in debt determination. Thank you. And I see questions from, uh, from Linda and Phil and Murray. So maybe Linda, we can, uh, we can go to you next. Oh, you're muted, Linda. Sorry. Thanks so much, Matt. Terrific presentation. Um, I put a couple of questions in the chat, but I also have another one about the nuance of mandatory consideration and mandatory referral, because that's obviously a conversation here in Alberta. And the current legislation 
um, does not have the words if death is imminent. So that is an addition to the proposed legislation. But could you comment on that if, if you're able to? Sure. And I see a related comment from Murray there in the chat as well. So I, I think that the important thing is that the, the, the law be worded in a way that gives the, the ODO the uh, authority to determine who or who not should be referred. Um, and so, for example, there have been several pan-Canadian initiatives right now um, around donor audits, that being relevant because it determines who is who should be considered to be a missed donor. Well, if you weren't considered to be a potential donor, you obviously weren't missed. And so really what has evolved out of those discussions has been that their end of life discussions are being are underway and that the patient is ventilated. Now those those two criteria, and, and that's kind of a condensing of what is often known as the give criteria, which is used in several um, several provinces. You know, give, give started with a, um, a grave prognosis and irreversibility. Well, essentially that's end of life discussions, you know, are either planned or happening. Um, and then ventilation is, is a key and then end of life. So what I would what I would say is what whatever is is used in the legislation, I think that the importance is that the policy is in the hands of the authority of the ODO to determine who's a potential donor. And, and as I mentioned on my slide, take that determination out of the hands of the bedside clinician in the ICU who, look, I'm an ICU doc, I'm a pediatric ICU doc, we're control freaks. We want that to be in our purview. <laughs> but the reality is this decision should be the ODOs who determine who should qualify as being eligible for referral. And then obviously it's the transplant programs who decide whether a, a referral is retained or not. And that person becomes an actual donor. Great, uh, Dr. Heller, and I see you, you had your hand up next. Yes, I enjoyed this presentation very much. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, this, I really admire the work that you're doing. Let's think about some things that are not happening and that is activity at the level of the federal government. Now, I appreciate that this is a federal provincial system where the provinces have responsibilities and they also have infrastructures which are threatened by activities by the federal government. But when you look at the United States currently has, uh, I think, 38 deceased organ donors per million. Spain has 38, Canada has 19. And we're not the only ones, Australia is like 18. Um, but if the benchmark is the United States and Spain, and they have had intense federal government activity, are we missing a level of activity that could be helpful? And I know that this threatens some people and other organizations, but it doesn't need to. Would it be helpful to have a discussion of the very issues you raised on the floor of the House of Commons or in committee as a process that leads to a, a, a way of establishing better support for all the organizations across the country and better clarification around the complex legal issues that you're raising? You know, I, I, I so I guess my short answer would be yes. <laughs> I think my longer answer is, I think it's, it's obviously a, um, a lot of delicate issues related to federalism and the federal provincial relationships. Um, you know, as you can see, I got a license plate from my home state of Kansas. Um, I'm an American working in Quebec um, who has learned a lot about these issues over the years. Um, the um, all provinces are sensitive around uh, provincial competencies, with healthcare being the the provincial competency, as so many of us know, um, and that is inherently in conflict with the reality of donation um, as opposed to just about any other aspect of healthcare, you know, Dennis knows this, we almost never have to transfer a patient to another province for care. We treat our patients, you know, if, if I have a patient with a heart condition in my pediatric ICU, it's going to be treated locally at the most, I'll, you know, very rarely have to send to Montreal. The reality of donation, however, is that every day, the ODOs across Canada are talking to each other about organ exchanges. That happens every single day. And so it is a, it is a, a very unusual situation in healthcare where there is much more of a need for federal standards, federal data collection, federal um, equity around how um, organ exchanges happen 
and how people get determined to be a donor. Um, that, that is much more important in the donation and transplantation world, I think, than just about any other aspect of, of, of medicine, um, which is something that I do try to explain to politicians. But, you know, just like anything, donation is, is a relatively small piece of even the healthcare pie. And to bring that up to someone in government who is responsible for provincial competencies, it's, it's hard to put that on their radar. Um, and so um, I think that is certainly something that would merit more federal um, harmonization, but not something that is always um, a priority in the system. Well, could I follow up then? Uh, one of the dimensions of that problem is sharing with the United States. Now here we have the highest organ donation rate in the world, just south of our border. And many of our cities are really close like Vancouver and Seattle. Um, and, but we're not able to access that. And, um, and some of the problems we have, like the highly sensitized patient, where we could get, a, get a access to the American system for sharing organs among highly sensitized people, it would, it would really save lives in the country. But in both countries, it may currently be illegal, but no one's addressed it. Um, how do we share across a border uh, when it seems so obvious that we could save lives by doing so across the country? So, so we, there are sharing across the border. Um, usually though, these, it's, it's, it's complex um, and even more complex lately because of COVID restrictions. Um, but certainly um, all, all of the ODOs across Canada do have relationships with UNOS, which is the uh, you know, United Network Organ Sharing in the, in the US. Um, but often the organs that are offered up for us are the ones who, that were re refused across Canada. And so it's often a low acceptance rate um, at UNOS. Um, and then the inverse is also true. It's usually only the organs that they really couldn't find anywhere else to, to place them. And so it's, 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 although in Toronto, they do quite well with organs that are offered um, from the states, from the, especially in the lung program. So I, I agree with this once again, it's a, um, it, it comes down to competencies or, or to um, regulations at the federal level and, and international as well. And so that's something that certainly could be addressed to facilitate. Murray, I see that uh, you had a question earlier on. Uh, I'm not sure if Matt was able to answer it. Uh, to your satisfaction, would you, did you want to? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I uh, I was called on a mid, I, I'm a liver transplant recipient from seven years ago. And I was uh, called at midnight on a Sunday and told to be at U of A hospital in four hours. They were gonna schedule me uh, in four hours. Well, we got there on time, but we actually didn't start the, the uh, 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 insertion of their, uh, taking out my old liver and putting in a new one for 28 hours. So the word imminent uh, uh, in the referral language, I, I find it, does that count for 28 hours or, I mean, how does that all work? Yeah, I, I think that it's a, um, it's a fair question. And I think that there are, there are two levels. I, I think that the first level is if you think it's gonna be imminent from a prospective or going forward, uh, 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 the perspective or from a retrospective where you're looking back at the charts. And so, for example, um, on uh, through discussions over the last you know year and a half, two years, I think where most people have settled is either if someone died within 12 or 24 hours, when you're looking retrospectively, then that person likely could have been a donor. And if they weren't referred, they, um, that's something that the, the, the program should be, that feedback should be given, that that should count as a missed donor. From a prospective perspective though, and, and, and Dennis can, and, and the other ICU clinicians can, can certainly relate to this, it is very difficult to know who's gonna die quickly and who's going to take a long time. Um, and so that's why I think most people would recommend that when you operationalize that, it's just everyone who is ventilated and you're planning a withdrawal upon, if they're not already in neurologic death, those people should be referred. Um, and I, so I think that is a, a, a situation where death should be considered imminent enough 
but I think the, the, the nuance here though, is I would recommend, this is a very personal level and I'm not, a, I'm neither a politician nor a lawyer, but I would recommend being cautious around being overly prescriptive mm -hmm. and defining it too narrowly in the text of the law, as opposed to making sure that the authority lies with the proper entity to make a decision around how we're going to define who and who is not a potential donor. I think that's really where the, the, the key lies. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Matt, two questions from uh, Patricia and Jen that I think uh, go well together. Uh, there are questions with regards to how do we create more trust in the system and how do we improve that culture of organ donation? And Jan, I love that phrase, uh, the culture of donation, because that's, that's really what we work with. So um, how do we go about doing that, Matt? How do, we, how do we bring more trust and work on that culture? Yeah, I, I think that um, for the culture donation, I think mandatory referral plays a big role. Um, and making sure that people understand that even if there's a low likelihood of that potential donor becoming an actual donor, go ahead and refer. And, you know, and then the people who are receiving those call need to make sure they're not wasting the time of the clinician um, and make sure that, you know, if it's, if it's an easy exclusion, we exclude and that we respect the work of everyone at the bedside who's working so hard often to maintain a, a potential donor and that we work hard to ensure that every potential donor that can be an actual donor is, is, is converted. And, and then also that, um, there's follow-up and useful follow-up, not just a slapping of the wrist, hey, you didn't call us, but really assistance to build, okay, what's going on? We've noticed that there's been a drop in identification referral, for example, or consent rates. And what do we think is going on? Can we add resources to your unit? And making sure that that relationship is tight. I think that's, that's something that really can assist with the culture donation. And as far as Patricia's question goes, I think people need, there needs to be public consultation um, to make sure that the law and the policies and the actual practice are all in line with what the public hopes. Um, they need to understand that tragically, not everyone can be saved when they come into an ICU, but we're going to do everything we can. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that life is safe first. But when we're in a situation where that life is no longer, that no longer can be prolonged and that either withdrawal of therapy or brain death becomes a reality, that then we're going to transition to donation and only then. And that needs to be publicly communicated. And then finally, ODOs need to be transparent about their performance. You know, the public trust um, systems and organizations that are transparent in their reporting um, and make sure that they are actually living up to their stated goals. I see we have a question from, uh, from Lori with her hand up. We'll, uh, we'll jump over there. And I think we may be coming closer at times. So maybe Lori will uh, have the last question here. Thanks very much. That was a terrific session, um, Matt. Thank you so much for all that information and, and uh, for the, the uh, interesting responses to the various questions afterward. I just had a simple uh, comment on Phil's uh, comments about um, trying to increase um, potential um, liaisons with, you know, with the system in the US. Um, what, what we found in pediatrics um, in contrast perhaps to what is prevailing in adults, but because of the size nature of tiny babies, often there are organs that are unused in the United States that we have been privileged to be able to accept, to be offered here in Canada and vice versa, because the competition, if you like, is so much different when you've got a, a size, a huge size issue that has to, to uh, be taken account. And so, you know, we very much want to facilitate those interactions so that organs are not used, organs that are not used in one place are able to be used in the other country. Thanks for that, Laurie. And, and as a note, Laurie is currently in Boston, presumably working on that exact topic um, <laughs> as another uh, expat American living in Canada. Um. <laughs> Well, this kind of brings us to about uh, well, just a few minutes before well, one o'clock local time. Um, certainly, I think we'd love to have uh, Dr. Weiss available for a few more hours to run through a number more questions. Uh, but I, I would like to to thank uh, to thank Matt, to thank ATI and, and Paladin, and uh, to everyone that's on this uh, this call today um, for for the interest, for the questions, and 
most importantly for the, the commitment to that culture of organ donation, which everyone is a part of. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, please send any feedback uh, towards ATI and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for, for attending. I really appreciate the opportunity.